the pieces of our worship service for today had already been done and put together when we learned about a sudden and tragic loss within our church family. Kathy Kohler passed away Saturday morning and we, we wanted to acknowledge this great loss within our midst before we moved into worship today. I don't think any of us will be able to move through worship without thinking and holding Rick, her husband, and her children in love and prayer. We love you. We are here for you. As we do enter into worship, we acknowledge this loss. We grieve and we mourn together. And we stand in the presence of a God who offers us a place to be caught when the ground beneath us is shaking. May it be so. Amen and amen. Three, two, four. Welcome to worship with us today. My name is Reverend Dawn Douglas Flowers and I serve at Parkway Hills United Methodist Church in Madison, Mississippi. And I am so thankful to be able to be in this space with you today as we spend a little time in worship, as we are renewed by God's word. I invite you to stick around, make sure you stick around towards the end of the service because we will have some information about options for gathering in person next Sunday. So stay tuned for that towards the end of the service. But this is indeed the day the Lord has made. I welcome you all into God's presence this day. And as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship, to worship let us pray. Almighty God, in Christ you have shown us the way, revealed to us your truth, and offered to us everlasting life. Keep our eye upon him, that we may see your path more clearly, know your truth more fully, and receive your life more abundantly. Through Christ who dwells with you and the Holy Spirit in eternal glory, Amen. I'm sure you've noticed that my surroundings, well, they're a little bit different today. I'm standing in the midst of a labyrinth. A labyrinth is simply a place to walk and to pray. You start at the entrance, you make your way to the center, and then you turn around and you make your way out. There's nothing mystical about it. It gives you the freedom to walk around while focusing your mind on God and not worry about getting lost. You walk into the center and you walk out. 
There are many turns, but there are no dead ends. Now, labyrinths have a long history inside and outside of the church. You can find them all over the world. Some of the earliest rock carvings, about 4,000 years ago, well, they included labyrinths. The purpose was personal and spiritual transformation. I thought about the labyrinth when I read Jesus's words in John 14, our I am statement for today. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He shares these words with his disciples at their last gathering together before Jesus is arrested and his journey toward the cross begins. He is sitting at table, sharing table with those who would desert and deny him. Those who would watch Jesus's crucifixion and surely question what to do next, where to go from here, what does it all mean? How do we even move forward. Jesus knows what is to come while he shares this meal with his disciples. So what he offers them is words of comfort and hope. I'm only going to read a few verses from John 14 today, but I invite you sometime this week, take time to read Jesus's whole message and prayer with and for his disciples found in John 13, chapters 13, through chapter 17. We'll also look closer at this next week as well. But as we prepare to hear God's word this day, let us pray. Lord, as we listen to your holy word, open our hearts to the power of your spirit. Call us out of darkness and lead us into your marvelous light. Amen reading from John 14, verses 1 through 12. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to, pre to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going? Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and in fact will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's a prayer that is attributed to Thomas Merton. I've shared it many times. It's a pretty famous prayer because it is a prayer that names the reality of trying to hold our faith in the midst of the unknown. It begins, my Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. After naming this reality, this truth, one that we all can understand, 
Thomas Merton, well, he pivots in his prayer. He says, but, but I believe. It's a prayer that begins by acknowledging the unknown, the uncertainty, that there's so much we have no control over, that there's so much we just don't know. But it ends with peace, with calm, with comfort. What Thomas Merton believes is that it doesn't matter if he doesn't know everything. It doesn't matter if the next step is unclear. All that matters is that he believes in a God who does. A God who, as the prayer says at the end, is ever with me and will never leave me to face my perils alone. All this, the labyrinth, this prayer of Merton, this is what I thought of with Jesus's words. I am the way and the truth and the life. You know, when we think about our human condition, so often we think we know the way, the right way, the correct way, the righteous way. We think we are the ones who get to be the arbiters of truth. And we for sure think we know the pieces to create a successful and worthwhile and meaningful life. But what we learn over and over and over again in life is what Merton named. We have no idea. We cannot know for certain, nor do we really know ourselves. And the fact that we think we are following God's will, well, it does not mean we are actually doing so. You hear this in the disciples in this passage, Lord, we don't know. How can we know? Into this reality steps Jesus. I want us to think just a minute on that first word Jesus uses, I am the way. Now, the way, those two words, it's a central theme in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The early Christians, well, they called themselves the followers of the way. In Acts chapter 9, verse 2, Saul, before his conversion experience to become Paul, he is still persecuting Christians and he asks for any found belonging to the way. The Psalms, well, they are full of this imagery of the way. Just listen to a few. The book of Psalms begins with, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Psalm 32, I will instruct you and teach you in the way. 139, search me, O God, know my heart, test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 86, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. 143, teach me the way that I should go. 25, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your path, lead me in your truth. And then Psalm 37, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. Jesus knew all of these Psalms. Jesus knew that when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that his disciples would have also held these prayers in their hearts. And let me tell you, let me share with you just a little bit about what was going on when the Gospel of John was written. What was happening in the lives of the followers of the way? John was the last Gospel to be written, probably around the end of the first century. Tensions between Jews and Christians was mounting. Nearly 40 years after Jesus' death, Israel revolted against Rome and was defeated. Many Christians at that time committed to non-violence. Well, they did not join in the revolt. So their loyalty 
to Israel was questioned and many were turned away from the synagogue. You find this language all throughout the gospel of John. They will put you out of the synagogue, it says. The Christians, followers of the way where they were cut off from the one place that made them feel connected to God and to God's people. On top of that, they became targets of persecution by Rome. So when the words of the Gospel of John were written and shared, Christians, followers of the way, would hear, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and they would find assurance that their faith was genuine, their connection to Christ real, their path, one that leads to God. Don't give up. Hang in there. Do not let your hearts be troubled, as John 14 begins. Believe in God. Believe also in me. I think back to that Merton prayer. I have no idea. I don't know. And I think of Bishop Will Willimon in his work, Incarnation, the surprising overlap of heaven and earth. And you know, he says the gospels. Well, they are full of people who confidently knew what was what until they meet Jesus. Why does Jesus say, I am the way and the truth and the life? Because in Jesus, we meet God. When we gather every Christmas Eve to sing carols and to light candles, we are witnessing to our belief in the incarnation. Emmanuel, God with us, birthed among us. Almighty God, the same being who hung the heavens and flung the stars in their courses, became a man who lived in Nazareth. Willimon says the incarnation is the counterintuitive, not believed by nine out of ten Americans, assertion that even though we could not avail ourselves of God, God lovingly became available. God condescended to be God with us. And the scriptures, the words we read and share, will they tell us the truth about Jesus, who is in turn the truth about God? And when we look to Jesus, what do we see? Jesus doesn't come providing people an escape route out of this world. Jesus intruded, as Willemont says, into the full, tragic human condition and by doing so, molded a new way of life, a different way, an alternative way of being and living in this world. And in this way, one may come to more fully know God. Jesus, for you and for me as followers of the way, well, Jesus becomes the test for all of our statements about God. And if we, as followers of the way, get Christ wrong, well, we get God wrong. I love how Willimon puts it in his book. He says, the incarnation leads us to try to love the world, the whole world, half as much as God loves in Jesus Christ. Following the same suffering, self-sacrificial way that Jesus loved. Incarnation not only tells us who God is, but also God's intentions for us. If others are to experience Christ as bread, as light, as door, as good shepherd, as resurrection and life, it will be through us. As one theologian said, Jesus as truth didn't just speak truth to us. He performed truth and fleshed the word. And he commanded us to do the same. When we look at the faith of Christ, 
was not some set of spiritual propositions, but rather it is an embodied, enacted relationship with a crucified Jew who is also the way that we are commanded to walk, the truth that we are meant to embody, and the life that we are meant to live. Our big question, who is God? Well, it has been answered graciously by God. Then we ask, how are we to live now that we know who God is? Now, if all of this seems just a little too much, a too big of a task, too risky of a calling, if hearing the words very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, if that sounds a little scary, well, think back. Think back to those words used to describe the labyrinth. It gives you freedom to walk around while focusing your mind on God and not worry about getting lost. You walk to the center, you walk out. There are many turns, but no dead ends. I am the way and the truth and the life, Jesus says. In me, you have the freedom to walk around while focusing your mind on God and not worry about getting lost. There will be many turns, but no dead ends. God with us so that we might be with God. Amen. come to a time of prayer together where we indeed do just lift up have thine own way Lord there are many many needs in our lives in our community in our world and we know that God hears hears our prayers receives our concerns our frustrations our confessions and then enter in, enters in to those in a way that we can never fully understand, but we trust is so. There will be space in this prayer 
where if you feel so led, you can lift up prayer concerns yourself aloud, silently where you are. You can type them into the comment section, um, but there will be space for you to spend your own time in prayer with God. But now, let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. God, we come to you this day, uniting our hearts in prayer. We pray for the church throughout the world, that all who profess to honor the risen Lord may be faithful in their witness and courageous in their testimony to the way of Jesus. We pray for pastors, teachers, ministers, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, they may seek to build the church upon Christ, the cornerstone, and humbly lead in faithful service. We pray for the governments of the world and its leaders, that the nations may indeed dwell in peace, that goodwill will prevail over strife, that people of faith may freely worship as their hearts direct. We pray for rain and sun in proper measure and for abundant food and water for all who dwell upon the earth. We pray for the sick and those in need and for any who are oppressed by wounds of the soul. We pray for our neighbors, that we may live together in unity and that strangers among us may find us to be hospitable friends. And we pray for our enemies that their sins may be forgiven them and that they might may find your peace. Almighty God, your son promised to grant whatever we ask in his name. And so now in this silence, we bring to you all of our concerns. We lift up our joys. We lift up our confessions, our frustrations, our own needs, for there are many. You are a God who hears our prayers. Receive these needs, these prayers, as we also lift up. Have thine own way, O Lord. Have thine own way. By your Holy Spirit, send us out into this new week. Empower us to minister to the world as your faithful disciples. That our work may testify to what we pray and show forth your eternal glory. Through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to thank everyone for spending this time with us, um, a time that hopefully has renewed your soul, um, has allowed you to hear and experience God's word um, through song, through spoken word, through prayer. If this place if this space, if Parkway Hills has been meaningful to you in some way, I do hope that you remember us in your giving. You can find on our website various ways to give, various ministries that you can give to so that we may continue to share the love and the grace of Jesus Christ around us with those in our community and with those in our world. 
and my Parkway Hills friends and those in the Madison area, I am excited to say that next week we will offer some in-person options to gather. You can join us outside of our church at 8.30 a.m. next Sunday, September 20th um, for an outside worship experience. Bring your own chair, bug spray, an umbrella for the sun, some water maybe. Uh, masks will be required as you go to your seat, but once your seat is placed, um, they're encouraged but not required. Um, so that's one way you can join with us. And then at 10.45 a.m. in our worship center, Sunday, September 20th, you can join us inside for a worship service. You must RSVP for the inside service. You can find information about that on our website. We'll still have our 10 o'clock virtual service. You can always join us here um, if you're still not comfortable venturing out. You can find all this on our newsletter. This coming Wednesday, we'll have a little video to give you more information about what to expect when gathering in person for worship, but as always, check out our newsletter, subscribe to receive it on Wednesdays. This is the best way to stay connected to all the ministries at Parkway Hills and to see how we are being church together and how you could be involved. And if you're looking for a place, a group of people to live out this way, that is Jesus's love, Jesus's uniqueness in this world, I hope you'll reach out to me or to our staff. We would love to be in conversation with you about that. But now receive this benediction as we move into a new week. May Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life be with you. May the Spirit empower you to serve in Christ's name. May God, who raised Christ from the dead, keep you forevermore. Until next week, my friends. Amen. Mm -hmm.